Hello, hello everybody. Welcome back to another exciting episode. I had another viewer request, and this one was, what would I tell some, or, or what knowledge would I pass off to somebody uh, who is new to the EV community, their first EV, um, probably specifically a Tesla, um, and um, they broke it down a bit, so I made a bunch of uh, lists to share with all of you. Now, uh, some of this might be pretty much common sense, some of it not something you might have thought of, and even if you are someone that's had a, a EV for a while, um, this might uh, might help might help you as well. So, first question, what can you do to increase your range? And uh, before I continue, I will say um, some of this might sound pretty stupid, but sometimes it's the simplest, stupidest stuff is what makes the biggest difference. Number one, vehicle weight. The more weight you have in your vehicle, the more power it takes to get it moving. Now, vehicle weight, if you have a lot of weight in your vehicle, it's not going to use as much power for freeway driving as it would for city. Uh, the problem being is, or, or the reason being, is in city, uh, you're taking a larger amount of weight, if it, if it is more weight, uh, and you are going to be doing a lot of stopping and going, so you're going to lose a lot more power uh, from the giddy up. And um, regenerative braking is nice, but sometimes, you, I mean, especially in the city, you might not be able to capture all of that wasted energy back, and you might end up using your friction brakes a little more. So, uh, something to think about is try and reduce the amount of weight you're going to be carrying with you. Um, this would be low on my priority list. Um, now, I have had uh, every square inch possible of the interior of my car, or my old MS-60, uh, filled with motorcycle parts in boxes. Uh, it came to like 2,000 pounds, and um, I did see a little bit of uh, reduction in, in, or increase in power usage, but not a lot. But it does make a difference. Here is a big one that you should be checking frequently. Tire pressure, yes! Back to the old tire pressure. Now, I found the pressure that Tesla recommends uh, down in your door jam there or in your owner's manual, that's like driving on a flat tire to me. It seems very soft and squishy. And uh, I also found I have increased energy consumption at those levels. I personally, keep my rear tires at 50 PSI and my front ones at 48. That's compared to approximately 45 that Tesla recommends. It gives a, uh, a better better handle and control too, uh, as well as um, increased range and slash decreased energy consumption. Now you might be asking, well, why 48 in the front and 50 in the rear? The reason is, uh, especially with either air conditioning or supercharging, the exhaust vents that the heat gets exhausted from for the radiators exhaust straight on your front tires in the wheel well. It's great in the winter for helping thaw out any slush and snow and ice that might get stuck under there, but in the summertime or warmer climates, what happens when things heat up? They expand. So if you had your tires at 50 PSI in the front and they heat up, they expand, you might end up with tires that were at 52, 53, 54 PSI, and that's getting a little bit too high now, because uh, at least on the Model S, uh, the cold tire pressure should be 50 PSI or lower, according to the sidewall. In the rear, it's minimal heating up because there is no cooling vents blasting that excess heat onto those tires. Speeds, yes, like anything, even though the Tesla Model S is pretty much in Model 3 and your Model X, those are the most aerodynamic vehicles, uh, production vehicles in the world, at least uh, I believe so, it used to be, um, they still do have wind resistance. And the faster you go, the more wind resistance you will have. Slow down. In actuality, for the Model S, you will get the most range at approximately 24 miles per hour. At 24 miles per hour on a 90 kilowatt hour battery pack, 
you should be able to push 550 miles of range out of your car. So if you want to go further with less charging, especially if you don't have a supercharger in your route, slow down. Drafting. This is something the autopilot and autonomous cars can do extremely well. But drafting something big like a semi-truck RV or somebody tr tr uh, pulling an enclosed trailer of some sort will cut down on wind resistance, thus giving you better range. Now, be very careful with drafting, especially if you don't have Traffic Aware Cruise Control or Autopilot. This is where Traffic Aware Cruise Control and Autopilot shine because you can set your distance away from the vehicle in front of you, turn it on, and it will keep your speed pretty much synced with whatever you're following. And if they break, so will your car, preferably with regen. And I have seen as much as a 40% increase in range drafting a semi-truck. Yes, that's probably, other than tire pressure, that's probably one of the biggest things you can do on the road to help you get more range. Of course, controlling your heat and air conditioning usage will help you increase your range. The heat especially. Uh, the heat in these cars is resistive heating. Think giant space heater up to six kilowatt draw. Um, that's, that's a lot of power, an insane amount of power. So if you don't have to be, uh, you know, if it's below freezing outside, and you don't really need to feel like you're on a tropical paradise inside your car. Just set your heat more comfortably. And air conditioning uses considerably less power than heat does for the summertime. However, it still can hit you up a little bit on that range. Um, so, if at least in the summertime, just turn your heat down or your air conditioning down a bit. And in the wintertime, if you can, if you can get away with it, Use your seat heaters instead of your cabin heat. The seat heaters can keep you nice and toasty because generally in the wintertime, you already got a coat on, so you really shouldn't be freezing too much. You just that little bit goes a long way. And the seat heaters use about 50 to 75 watts each. Same with the steering wheel heater, although steering wheel heater is not really that necessary, especially in the day and age of autopilot. Range mode. Range mode is also excellent for increasing your range. As it sounds, range mode gives you more range. How does range mode do that? A couple different ways. If you have, well, for all the vehicles, it turns down the um, heating power and air conditioning power of the car. So it won't, it'll still get you, trust me, I, I leave my range mode on year round. In the summer, my air conditioning still gets just as freezing. It might take a few minutes longer for the AC to get to that ultra cold temp. Um, and in the summer, or in the winter time, it might take about a minute longer to start warming up the cabin. But in the end, uh, we're pretty darn comfortable. Another thing turning on range mode does is it reduces the temperature at which your battery pack heater turns on at. Now, why would you say, why would I want to turn off my battery pack heater or turn it down? Well, instead of it kicking on when the battery pack is at or below freezing, it doesn't kick on then until it's about negative 10 degrees Fahrenheit or colder. And uh, what are you going to lose? You're going to, re you're going to lose some or all of your regen braking if the battery pack is too cold. However, if the battery pack heater draws an insane amount of power. So you are actually, in most cases, going to lose more power heating the battery pack up just to get regen than you would if you just left the battery pack heater off and used your friction brakes until your battery pack warms up just from normal driving. And it does. I um, I had to drive about 20 miles this morning, and um, I, got, I got some regen back after about uh, three minutes of driving. The regen started coming back, and after about... 20 miles, I had my full regen back, which I really didn't need it anyways because I was on the freeway most of that. Another thing range mode does, very beneficial for any of the Tesla cars that have dual motors. 
it puts your rear motor in sleep mode, powering you with just your front, smaller front motor, uh, especially if you have a, a performance car. What was that? Oh, notification. So when you're just cruising along on the freeway or on a country road or just someplace where you don't need two motors to be wasting power, your rear motor goes to sleep, consuming nothing. So it's basically in neutral and you are just being propelled and maintained speed with your front motor. Now you're going to say, well, what happens if I need that extra power of that second motor? That's the nice thing about it. With the electric motor, it can reactivate so quickly as Tesla would say it's imperceivable how quickly it reactivates that means it happens so quick you don't even you don't even know there's a lag time if you smash that pedal down and you need that extra power done you got it but that can be a great power saver especially when doing drives on the freeway ride height for air suspension there's a little bit of debate on this but generally the lower you put your air suspension the better range you're going to get because you're taking you're getting less turbulence underneath the vehicle although it's pretty smooth already uh, but one thing to keep in mind um, you're probably going to get the overall um, it's best to keep it around normal uh, or um, what are they called i don't have air suspension i like coil um, i think it's a uh, standard it's called standard um, standard when i when i was playing around with some of the loaners that i've had over the years seemed to be the best um, and I've also seen reports that uh, the lowest ride height also can cause premature tire wear on the inside toe even more than normal. Um, so standard uh, for the best tire life and range. Um, if you really need the range, then go down to the lowest setting if permitted. Towing. It's another one. Drag and weight. Towing a trailer, either with an S or an X. Uh, well, when you're towing a trailer... Uh, once again, it's going back all the way up to vehicle weight that we covered at the top. Um, the weight of the trailer isn't so much of a range changer than its drag. I'll give you an example. I have two camping trailers. I just bought the second one, and in the summer, it was a great price. My teardrop camping trailer is 750 pounds. My pop-up camping trailer is 950 pounds. The teardrop uses almost about a hundred watts per mile which is a lot more than towing with the pop -up. why is that because the teardrop is higher crests a little bit higher it's about even with the roof of the car the pop-up sits about two and a half feet lower than the teardrop letting it sit more in the slipstream of the vehicle so basically the car th or think of it this way think of it like the trailer is then drafting the car Whereas the teardrop acts more like a sail trying to slow me down, or parachute trying to slow the car down. As such, even though it's heavier, it still uses less power. So think about that if you're planning on towing a trailer. Go for more aerodynamic over lighter weight. Of course, stay within your vehicle's towing capacity. Uh, officially, Model X is about 5,000 pound towing capacity, and the Model S officially can't tow at all. Unofficially, 2,000 pounds or less. Tire sizes. Ooh, this is a touchy subject for some. For your Model S, <clears throat> your ideal tire size is going to be a 19. And I found the good old Goodyear Eagle RSA 2 All Seasons are cheap, and they do an excellent job. Uh, you will see some range loss on 21-inch tires. On the Model X, you have a choice between 20s and 23s. Ah, another notification. So, if you're worried about range and tire life, go with the smaller size tire and price. <clears throat> another thing is don't be afraid to 100% charge. Contrary to popular belief, 100% charging your car, charging your battery up to 100%, will not ruin the battery, or really, or at least unless you're doing it every day for years on end, it will not cause problems for your battery. 
What will cause problems is if you charge to 100% and leave it there for an extended period of time, especially in high temperatures. So if you're going to go on a road trip and you, or, or it's going to be a busy day, do not be afraid to charge your car to 100% as long as you're going to use it that day. It's not going to hurt anything. In fact, I do have an upcoming video. I have left two cells. I have two cells uh, from a Tesla Model S battery pack. One was left completely dead, and the other one, or what would be considered dead, it was about 3.2 volts. And the other one I left at a 100% state of charge for, so far we're going on a year and a half. And um, we're going to, I'm going to be touching on that video soon. And we're going to be testing those to see how much capacity loss in those batteries at the extreme. One at the extreme of being 100%, one at the extreme of being dead. We're going to benchmark them and see how much capacity after a year and a half they have lost. And I'm going to tell you it's going to be very little, if even measurable at all. And top that off with the awesome battery management system in these cars. So don't be afraid to 100% charge. If you need it, use it. If you don't, then don't. If you don't need it, then just do a regular 90% charge for the day. Um, now, one thing you could also do if you're still worried about that degradation, turn the charge amperage down overnight so that way the charge completes closer to the time you will be needing the vehicle. So if you're going to be needing it the car at 9 in the morning, uh, try and time your charge so it ends at maybe 8 or 8.30 in the morning. That way it's not sitting at 100% as long.